Nancy Nichols spent three years on oxygen without any answers as to why she was so sick until she came here to the University of Kansas Health System where a cardiologist gave her her life back. From the University of Kansas Health System. I am amazed. The team here is great. I came on a Tuesday and then by Saturday I had a heart in me. I have never seen a group of people work together so good as this team of heart specialists. I mean, it's just unreal. Stand by to set up show. And the Dolph C. Simons Three, Jr. Family two, Broadcast one. Studio. Roll it. Always makes you feel like you're the most important patient on the planet. I felt heard and that was really big. This is All Things Heart. Good morning and welcome to All Things Heart. We do want to start this morning with an important conversation. It's related to yesterday's shooting at the Chiefs Super Bowl parade and rally. One person died. More than 20 others were shot, including nine children. Thousands of people witnessed the panic outside Union Station. And then there were the frantic family members, maybe you were one of them, trying to reach their loved ones who were there to see if they were OK and the countless others who were watching it unfold on television. Dr. Stephen Lassen is with us this morning. He's a pediatric psychologist here at the University of Kansas Health System, and we want to discuss how this trauma might affect kids and how to talk about it. And Dr. Lassen, you told us you've had parents reaching out to you. What have they been saying or asking? Yeah, so yesterday, even before I knew what had happened, I was getting uh, messages from parents asking what they should tell their kids who had just seen people shot and lying on the ground. And so I had to quickly um, educate myself about what had been happening. And ever since then, I've been hearing from parents about uh, questions, what do I tell my kids? How do I talk to them? What do they need? How do I support them right now? So understandably, a lot of questions that parents never imagine they will have to answer. Every child's different, different ages, different dynamics. Is there any common piece of advice you can give us as parents on where we start with this conversation? Yeah, so the most important thing is that we do start the conversation. Again, sometimes the tendency after events like these is to not talk because we're uncomfortable, we don't know what to say. And so starting the conversation is the most important thing, even when we're uncomfortable, when we don't have all of the answers or information. So starting the conversation is critical. And usually a good place to start is by asking kids what they know already. At this point, kids will have been talking with friends, they will have heard things on uh, different media outlets, and now that kids, most kids are returning to school today, schools are gonna start having some conversations with students as well. So we need to make sure we start with what kids already know. When I got home last night to my 10 and 13 year old, they hadn't heard anything yet. And so that gave us a starting point with our kids where to start our conversation. So we start the conversation that way, and then we listen carefully for any inaccuracies or misinformation that kids might have. And then those are things that we'll want to gently correct and um, provide accurate information on. As part of these conversations, we wanna make sure that we're doing a lot of listening, a lot of validating, and acknowledging what kids are feeling, what they're thinking, what they're going through. In these early stages after events like these, there can be a lot of anxiety, a lot of shock and fear and anger, and those things are normal, and we need kids to understand that those are normal reactions. There's nothing wrong with them for feeling those things. I think reassuring them is another really important part of those conversations. We reassure them that they are safe now. We reassure them that we're gonna do whatever we can to take care of them and to keep them safe. We reassure them that the event is over. We reassure them that the victims are being cared for. So all of that reassurance is really critical for kids who are um, unsure of how to proceed and what to think of all this. Are there any classic <laughs> warning signs that your child or your teenager is not doing well? There certainly are. Kids are pretty good at telling us when they're not doing well, fortunately. And so we want to be aware of any 
persistent changes in emotions or behaviors that we notice that, that uh, emerge. We want to look at things like sleep patterns and, and appetite, overall mood, school performance, uh, social relations, all of those things uh, will change if kids are struggling. Now there, there is a subset of kids who will kind of withdraw and not exhibit some of those signs, but those, those tend to be um, more the exception. Most kids are going to show us pretty clearly if they're not doing well and will give us an opportunity then to um, get them additional support. There are lots of parents who have multiple kids, different ages. Do those parents need to have separate conversations with each child based on their age? Yeah, that's a great question. Age differences do matter in situations like these, especially large gaps. So if you've got very young children and then older adolescents, I, I recommend usually that parents start the conversation with everybody in the room. I think it, it gives a sense of cohesiveness to the family. And, and allows everyone to kind of start on the same, on the same, uh, on the same level. But then after that, there, there very well may need to be additional conversations, especially with older kids. Older kids uh, are able to process information at a deeper level in a more adult-like way. And so I think additional conversations with them could be helpful. Now, in all of this, we, we need to not focus as much on age as emotional maturity. It could very well be that you have a 12 or 13 year old who is very emotionally mature and could handle more information. And those are things that as parents, you just have to be mindful of. Each parent, I think, is, is aware of how their child processes information ge generally and will, will be able to do that. Dr. Lassen, we really want to thank you for taking time to come on our program. It's been such a tough, tough uh, second half of the day yesterday and morning, so we appreciate you shed helping us shed light on how better to communicate with our kids, and we'll be checking back with you, I'm sure, throughout the day as we continue to get thank more you. calls from, from other, other sources. Thank you, Dr. Lassen. Thank you. Now to our regularly scheduled program, because we do have a very uplifting story today. It's about a woman named Nancy Nichols. Starts out pretty rough. She spent three years on oxygen. She made dozens of trips to the emergency department. She had fainting spells, and with no clear answers, she was falling into a depression. The 62-year-old had never smoked or had any lung problems, but she was on oxygen for 24 hours a day, and instead of feeling better, she got worse and worse. She was desperately trying to keep faith, thinking there had to be someone who could help her. She was right. 62-year-old Nancy Nichols walks a mile a day in the halls of her Southwest Kansas apartment complex, something she never would have been able to do a year ago. I kept thinking something's not right. In 2019, Nancy was suffering from shortness of breath and fainting spells. Her oxygen levels were dangerously low, but no one knew why. Nancy was placed on oxygen 24 hours a day, but her condition deteriorated. I was told I was having a stroke. And I thought, I'm not having a stroke. They didn't have an answer, and I wasn't satisfied. But I prayed to God every day that he would heal my lungs. It was a pulmonologist in Hutchinson, Kansas, who put Nancy on the path to healing when he referred her to the University of Kansas Health System. They sent my records. I had received a call from a pulmonologist, and she was the one that said, Nancy, you need to see a cardiologist right away. And I said, you're kidding. And she transferred my records to Dr. Hodge, and he was one that discovered the hole in my heart. She says almost immediately after Dr. George Hodge repaired it, she felt like a new woman and hasn't been on oxygen since. His wisdom and knowledge <clears throat> was what struck me. I was in complete awe of Dr. Hodge, and I thought I should have been to him years ago. Had anybody known it was my heart, Nancy says she believes God put Dr. Hodge in her life for a reason, and she's so grateful every day she gets to see her grandson go fishing or play soccer. When he makes a goal, he runs down the field with his arms in the air. She can take care of her mom now, and? Just recently, 
About a month ago, I was given an Angel Among Us certificate. She now ministers to female inmates at the local county jail. It's a bright future for me. I'm not in a nursing home. I'm not on oxygen. It's a great feeling. I haven't felt this good in three years. We are so pleased to have Nancy join us live today from her home in Dodge City, Kansas. Nancy, you look amazing. You look amazing in red, and I love your scarf with the hearts on it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And we're Thank also you. joined by her interventional cardiologist, Dr. George Hodge. Thank you so much for making time to join our discussion, Dr. Hodge. Thank you. I want to start with Nancy. Nancy, you spent three years on oxygen, three years. You've also said that your apartment began to feel like a nursing home, which must have been so tough. It was tough. I was inactive. I was depressed. My homey apartment had the atmosphere of a nursing home, mm. oxygen machines everywhere, tubing going every which direction. I just everywhere I would go out in public and people would stare at me like what's wrong with her and it was it was very a very trying time for me it was a long imagine. three years yeah and 24 hours yeah. a day being on oxygen you had pneumonia before this so you initially thought the problem was your lungs understandably did you have any inkling that it was your heart no, no inkling at all, Alexis. Mm. And before I you... I had seen other doctors, mm -hmm. had seen medical doctors, pulmonologists, cardiologists, and they would all tell me that they couldn't find anything wrong. And I would respond with, well, something's wrong somewhere, or I wouldn't be on oxygen 24-7. So when the pulmonologist from KU called me and said I needed to see a car cardiologist from KU, I was surprised. I'm like, this is really interesting news. And thank God you were able to get in with Dr. Hodge. Now, Dr. Hodge, when you first see Nancy and she tells you this has been three years, she's been on oxygen, doesn't know what's wrong, what's the first test as a cardiologist that you run? We usually start with an echocardiogram, and um, with the story of needing oxygen, and even on oxygen, the oxygen levels continue to go. We suspect um, some shunting in the in the blood from right to left, from left to right, and so we look for holes in the heart when when we hear this kind of a story. Um, and so, a transesophageal echo is the best test to look for that, and that's a test where we go down from the throat and we take good quality pictures of the heart chambers and of the uh, septum or the membranes between the chambers of the heart. And is that when you first saw the hole in her heart? Yes, we had a suspicion on the surface echocardiogram, which is the across the chest echocardiogram, but we confirmed that you can't really see the hole with a surface echocardiogram. You get a hint that there's something there, that there's some shunt of the blood from side to side, but you don't really actually see the size and the actual hole until you do the transesophageal echocardiogram, which is the one where we put the ultrasound uh, probe down the throat, down the esophagus. I gotta ask, as a non-medical person, when I hear hole in the heart, I'm trying to envision that. Is it, when you finally do see it, is it a hole that's like the size of a pinky fingernail? Is it a minuscule hole, like a pinprick? How big was the hole in her heart? So holes are, can be small, can be large. Uh, her um, uh, defect uh, was called atrial septal defect, which is ASD, and that's something that she was born with. And it was a medium size, so um, it wasn't um, large, but it wasn't small either. And um, usually large, very large holes are discovered earlier in life. Um, very small holes, you may never know about them. And moderate size holes is not actually uncommon to discover them later in life. Uh, but what's medium? It, it's hard. What's a medium size uh, hole? Just so we can visualize so it. So I think hers is around uh, 25 millimeters. Okay. Okay. So, Nancy, you hear you've been living with a hole in your heart. What's your reaction to hearing that? 
I was surprised. I, I've been a surgical technologist since 2000, and I worked with trauma one, level trauma one surgeries. I knew the importance of the heart, but I didn't realize the anatomy and physiology until I met up with Dr. Hodge. I just, I was really surprised that I had a hole in my heart. And that was a problem for who knows how many years. Dr. Hodge, do you think she was born with it? Yes, this is the uh, atrial septal defects are called congenital defects, meaning that they were present since birth. So before all of this, Nancy, you had a pacemaker implanted. Do you still have the pacemaker? Yes, I still do. So Dr. Hodge, how is it that all these other doctors see her, they can't figure out what's wrong, even when placing the pacemaker in Nancy, these doctors at other places, not here at the health system, how is it they don't see or notice that she has a hole in her heart? So as I mentioned before, so the pacemaker is for a different condition that she had, which is a problem in the electrical problem of the heart, electrical conduction of the heart. So she needed a pacemaker because the electricity of the heart wasn't working well. That was well before um, uh, she came to see us. And um, before pacemaker, a transthoracic or surface echocardiogram across the chest is done. But again, if, if we're not looking carefully at that particular region of the heart, uh, we don't see the hole, we don't see the uh, color shunting or the blood shunting across that area of the heart. Um, when you place the pacemaker, you don't use echocardiogram, you use fluoroscopy, and that doesn't really show you that portion or that part of the heart. There's a, a lot of credit then to go to the pulmonologist who sent Nancy to you. Yes, and like I said, every time somebody has low oxygen levels and you give them oxygen, and they should get better with oxygen, but when you give them oxygen and, and they still don't get better, that usually indicates that there is what we call a venous blood going into the arterial blood, meaning that the blood that is low on oxygen is being mixed up with the blood that is rich in oxygen, which no matter how much oxygen you're giving, you're always losing this battle because there's always this venous blood going to the arterial blood. And so it was very, very important and wise that that observation was made that, hey, this sounds like something not pulmonary, it sounds like something cardiac because it's not responding to oxygen treatment. You shared some incredible images and videos with us to show how you went in there and you fixed Nancy's heart. So we're gonna share those with our viewers. I would love it if you could walk us through what we're seeing here. So this is one of the devices that we have. It's kind of made out of two umbrellas. And um, kind of one umbrella is deployed on the left side, and one umbrella is deployed on the right side, and they're connected with a little stalk. This is gonna show you how we put the wire across the hole, and then after that, we're deploying a catheter that uh, the umbrellas are sheathed in there. That's the first umbrella being um, deployed on the left side of the heart. We drag it against the hole, and then we deploy the second umbrella there, and the two are connected with each other. And we have full control of this, it's still attached. Once we take good pictures of it, we like it, we lock it, that's the locking mechanism, and after that, we let it go. What's it made out of? Uh, it's made out of PTFE, and that material is very soft, doesn't cause any erosion in the heart, and as you uh, saw a hint of that in the last moment of that video, the uh, body will cover that with a new tissue uh, in about three months, um, and so after three months, this is all covered up with healthy tissue after that. How long does that procedure take? Um, about an hour, a um, little more, a little less, depending on the defect. Um, if the hole is straightforward, it'll be less. If the hole is very large and complex and doesn't have enough rims around it, it may take longer and may require more than one device on occasion. Nancy, I want to ask you, What's it like for you to watch this video and know that that's what's in your heart, patching things up, and how Dr. Hodge was able to fix you? It's incredible, the medical technology, but mainly the University of Kansas has some of the greatest medical experts like Dr. Hodge. 
If I had not gone to Dr. Hodge, I would still be on oxygen, definitely. Maybe in a nursing home, maybe in a wheelchair. I have a completely different lifestyle. It's, my life is pretty much normal. I'm, I'm really happy these days. That is the best thing that anyone could hear, that you got back to the normal life that you really were enjoying already that was really brought to a standstill for those three years. Um, one quick question about yes. the procedure before we get to community questions. Did they go through your leg for that? Yes, they went through the groin. Okay. And were you sore what? after, or what was it like when you came, came to from the procedure? I spent the night, I believe, in intensive care one night. And the very following day, Alexis, I was off of oxygen. Oh it was gosh. a complete 180 turnaround. And I just, I felt, I felt like a whole new person. I remember saying, I quoted scripture, Isaiah 6, 8, here I am, Lord, send me, which is a message to the Lord that I am well, I'm here to serve the purpose that you have for me. That's beautiful. And we are already getting some community questions. Yeah. We love getting our questions from the viewers. They're the heartbeat of this uh -huh. program. So be sure to send them in to us. We're on YouTube, Facebook, the X platform. You can also reach us in real time at the All Things Heart email. All the links are there on your screen. Let's get some of the questions from our viewers that have been emailed to us. We have a question from Anne. And Anne, well, I think Anne, your question was already answered because Nancy says the recovery was quick by Within a day, Nancy, you were back to normal. Yes, yes. John has a question for Dr. Hodge. John wants to know, what are the biggest risks when you do this kind of procedure? These procedures are pretty safe. Uh, the risks are, uh, the major risks are very rare. They're you know, one in a thousand. So stroke is a possibility, but it's also very rare, less than one in a thousand. If the uh, defect has good rims, the chance of the device moving or dislodging is extremely low. Um, and if that happens, then we retract the device, but that is a possibility. Um, injury to the heart chambers from wires and catheters can happen, uh, which can lead to fluid around the heart that we would drain. That's also very rare, well below one in, a, in a 500 or 1,000 of the cases. We're going through the leg veins, like Nancy mentioned, so bruising and uh, some mild discomfort in the leg veins where we poke and we pass the catheters is a possibility, so we have some bed rest um, uh, after that. The chance of needing to open the chest is extremely rare. It's, it's less than one in a thousand. Um, the patient is not under general anesthesia. We use um, conscious sedation, so some um, moderate amount of sedation with their set and fentanyl. So they're kind of in this twilight zone, but they're arousable. So um, risk from anesthesia is, is very low as well. Terry has a question for you, Dr. Hodge. Terry wants to know if Nancy's symptoms were common for a hole in the heart. Would trouble breathing be the biggest indicator? Yes, certainly trouble breathing. The trick is trouble breathing can be due to a very large number of medical conditions. Um, and this condition is not the most common reason for having shortness of breath by far. Uh, but the main indicator that there is what we call shunting is that the oxygen level is low, we're giving oxygen, and it's not getting better. That's a really red flag that it's got to be a uh, shunting of the blood through a hole. And Nancy, when you look back, were there any other signs that there was a problem, or was it strictly the, the problem that you thought was your lungs for good reason? I didn't know what it was. I really, right. I knew there was something that wasn't right but I couldn't get anyone to listen to me. As soon as I connected with Dr. Hodge, I felt a great sense of compassion and care. I finally found somebody that had an answer, and I was actually overjoyed with, with that I had a hole in my heart. Right. The doctor found the problem, and it could be treated, and it was quite simple. It's a beautiful thing. 
Jean has a good question for Dr. Hodge. Jean, one of our Facebook viewers, writes in, since the hole was congenital, why didn't the problem show up years ago? That's a very good question. Um, oftentimes, the holes are not as large uh, when we are born as later in life. Um, and the uh, enlargement, so this hole puts strain on the right side of the heart, and Nancy's right heart chambers were enlarging. And as the right heart chambers enlarge more and more, and more dysfunction of the right side of the heart can happen, including enlargement or failure of the valve on the right side uh, or weakening of the chambers of the right side. And so it does take time for these consequences of this blood shunting to show up more and more. Um, that's why um, if it's a very large hole, it will show itself at the young age. If it's not a very large hole, kind of a moderate size hole, it could be in the 50s and in this case in the 60s till we discover the hole. Um, and again, if it's a one or two millimeter hole, uh, we can live with it all our life and not have a problem because the amount of blood going from one side to the other is not going to affect uh, the right side chambers of the heart much. Nancy, I want to share this beautiful letter that you sent to Bob Page, who's the president and CEO here at the University of Kansas Health System. You sent a letter right to the top dog here. And Dr. Hodge, we want you to hear this because the letter's about you. So the letter that Nancy wrote to the president President Bob Page reads in part, when Dr. Hodge repaired the hole in my heart, it instantaneously healed my lungs. I believe if it were not for Dr. Hodge and his expertise, I would be in a nursing home and in a wheelchair on oxygen to keep me alive. Now I have a second chance to watch my grandson play soccer, basketball, go fishing. I help him make my famous chocolate chip cookies. I'm able to take a daily walk in the mornings without shortness of breath. Nancy, that is such a sweet letter and so nice that you sent that to Bob Page. He replied to you? He did. And I've kept the letter in my file as a reminder that if there's anyone out there looking for medical opinions, expert advice, to contact Dr. Hodge at the University of Kansas I highly recommend that, just to give them a call and start start the process of finding out why. Dr. Hodge, how does it feel to hear that letter? I mean, what a great way to start your day. See your former patient so happy mm -hmm. and vibrant and have that letter sent to <laughs> the CEO of the health system. I always say I'm really grateful, and I, I always say I have the most rewarding job uh, ever because uh, of experiences like this. Uh, there is nothing that is more rewarding than seeing how well Nancy is doing. Uh, there is nothing more rewarding than seeing how uh, uh, she's off the oxygen. She has, um, uh, you know, a, a, the ability to walk and be independent. Um, this just makes me uh, extremely, extremely happy, and that's what keeps me going. Nancy, real quick, are you willing to share the secret recipe for the chocolate chip cookies with anyone else besides your grandson? Because I like that recipe. Absolutely. Oh, great. All right. Well, I'm going to have Cliff. They're on, the, the they're on the back of a chocolate chip bag recipe. Oh, that's the secret? <laughs> and I mix the chocolate chips. Oh, nice. I mix a bag of milk chocolate chips and semi-sweet chocolate chips. Okay. That's the secret. It's the mixture. Uh -huh. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. Uh -huh. we, we love sharing yeah. the incredible work that our doctors do at the health system like Dr. Hodge. We also love showing you what life looks like for them outside of these hospital walls. Now for a secret look into the guardians of healthcare at the University of Kansas Health System. Let's go behind the mask. Okay, Dr. Hodge, who is this cute little guy with you? This is my little angel, William. Uh, uh -huh. He is uh, three and a half years old, and he definitely keeps me very busy. <laughs> <laughs> is he uh -huh. interested in what you do? Do you bring home your, your stethoscope, or does he ask you about what it's like to be a doctor yet? Nope. He wants trains and trucks and airplanes and helicopters and all these things. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Don't rush it. That's awesome. Mm. And he must be the love of your life. What a cute little guy. Thank you for Absolutely. sharing those pictures with us. 
And thank you, Nancy, to taking time to share your journey. It's going to help a lot of people. Dr. Hodge, thank you so much for your time. And thank you to our viewers for joining the conversation and for being with us today. Coming up next week on All Things Heart. A former patient says COVID saved her life. That's not something you hear every day. We will explain how next Thursday at 8 a.m. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update. Vaping can hurt your lungs, your blood vessels, even your stress levels. And too many teens don't appreciate the risks. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update. Meet researchers who see the firsthand effects of vaping and hear what it's like to be addicted. Friday at 8.